House of Ed Tech, Episode 10. Hi, everybody. This is Principal Jay or Jessica Johnson, Principal at Dodgeland in Wisconsin, and you are listening to the House of Ed Tech with Christopher Nessie. This episode of House of Ed Tech is brought to you by Audible.com. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Nessie. The House of Ed Tech podcast explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. My objectives include discussing technology that is changing our classrooms and schools and sharing information that you can hear about today and use tomorrow by talking to teachers, leaders, and creators like you and having them share their stories. Because whether you use it or not, Technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. Coming up in this episode, I have a great interview with high school English teacher, Natalie O'Neill. I'm also going to share with you another EdTech thought, a great EdTech recommendation, and announce to you this episode's House of EdTech VIP. But first... You may have heard something a little different in the opening of this episode. That's right, the House of EdTech has a sponsor. What does this mean for you? Well, nothing. And by nothing, I mean you can get something for nothing. As a House of EdTech listener, you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of what Audible has to offer. Just go to www.audibletrial.com slash houseofedtech. Audible has over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 player. Before I share this episode's featured content, I would like to wish all the moms a very happy Mother's Day. I would specifically like to thank my mom for all the love and guidance she has given me, and I also want to thank my mother-in-law for all the support and love she has showed me. And to my wife, Caitlin, for being the best mom that my little guy, Miles, could ever have. And now... For this episode's featured content, my interview with Natalie O'Neill. Natalie is an English teacher at West Morris Central High School in Chester, New Jersey, which is part of the West Morris Regional School District. She's taught creative writing and all levels of freshmen, and she currently teaches seniors and sophomores. Natalie is also an adjunct instructor at Ramapo College, which is in Mawa, New Jersey, where she teaches a course she created for their first year experience program. She's a graduate of Rutgers University, where she earned her bachelor's in English and a master's of education in English, and she also has a second master's in liberal studies from Ramapo. She has presented at NWP, NJECC, as well as the New York, New Jersey Google Summit. And if that wasn't enough, she's also a junior Olympic fencer, and she's currently the varsity girls fencing, fencing coach and Cultural Arts Club Advisor. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech, Natalie O'Neill. Thanks. Nice to be here. As I said before we kind of started this, you are a lightning bolt, you're flash, you are here, you are in the Ed Tech world, and you have just jumped into the deep end of the pool, and you are making all sorts of waves and splashes in all sorts of positive ways, and that's kind of why I wanted to bring you on the podcast and talk to you about everything that you're doing that's wonderful. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I believe that uh, you go big or you go home. Tell us about Natalie. Who are you? Okay, so um, I've been working at West Morris for, for a couple of years now, and um, we just went through some, some really awesome changes. And it all started where we were starting to get some PD on some new tech tools that we could use by um, a, a woman named Erica Hartman. Within a year, she was hired as our new tech supervisor. And once she came in, we started really going Google. I was just really impressed with all of the really cool things that Google for Education has been doing, and I wanted to learn all about it. So I started using Google in my classroom. I dabbled with sharing docs with my students and doing some collaborative creating and composing, and it just took off from there. Now, you're an English teacher. I'm a social studies teacher. So, uh, and I've said this with some previous guests, I want to get a little bit of a history lesson about you. Uh, why do you want, why are you a teacher? Where, where did this come from? How did, how did you get into and decide, I want to be a teacher? Yeah, I think it really started, um, 
in college, I had an amazing professor. I liked him so much that I ended up taking four or five of his courses, Professor Wes Brown from Rutgers. And uh, he was just such an inspiration in my life. He had these really great anecdotal stories. And he really just made me want to learn whatever he was offering. Uh, and I started to decide that English was where I wanted to be. Actually took a lot of African-American lit courses because he was the professor. And and he just really inspired this love of learning in me. And as a result of meeting him and taking some of his courses, I just started taking some more lit courses and thought, wow, not only do I love literature and I love writing and I love the creative aspect, but this this teaching gig seems like something I could I could handle. You know, I like the idea of talking to people, finding out what they're interested in, sharing what we know and really learning together. So it wasn't just about the holidays and the summer break. No, not at all. It was definitely about the uh, the personal connections and the the experiences and the innovation. Absolutely. And, and sometimes the personal connections are what gets lost in education today, unfortunately. Right. What are some of the ways that you're leveraging Google Apps in your classroom? You're obviously in a Google Apps for Education district. What are some things that you're doing? Um, it, it really started to take off when I decided to use G Class folders. That script has changed my life. Um, I've been able to basically go, I would say, probably 90% paperless, although I totally allow kids to use notebooks and paper and write, handwrite. Um, I love the idea that they can stay organized by taking content that I'm sharing with them, sharing their content with me and their peers and keeping it all in one place. Because when you're traveling, you know, three minutes between classes, you might not be able to stop off at your locker, get your books or your notebooks, everything that they could really need for my class. I can share with them in G class folders, whether it's a digital copy of the text we're reading or PowerPoint presentations through Google presentations, um, links to videos and other cool things like that. How long have you been a teacher? This is my ninth year. Ninth year, almost a decade of excellence coming up. Now, if you're just into EdTech now, what was your classroom like before EdTech? You know, we did a lot of innovative things. I remember one of the um, the greatest moments that I ever experienced was a couple of years ago when I had first transferred to West Morris. I was given um, mostly freshman classes and a teacher knows teaching the same thing five times a day could end up getting redundant. So I wanted to think of a way that I could really make the class unique. I always had a love of mythology myself. So I decided that I would have each class put on their own performance, a recreation of a, an ancient Greek myth. They would dress up. We would all bring in um, traditional Greek food and we would have a, a Greek festival. And it got big enough where we invited other classes and um administrators to come see our performance. And I'm not trained in drama in any way whatsoever, but the experience really fostered a love of mythology and literature in my students. And uh, it ended up turning into me taking 50 some odd kids to Greece um, over spring break one year. So that's kind of the, the type of teaching I, I do. I, again, I go in all the way. I commit to something. I try to make it as, as interesting to the students as possible. And uh, then we see where we can go from there. Now, I have a little bit of acne, acting experience. It sounds like you would be, if we were going to combine drama and acting, you'd be a method teacher. You yeah. Really, you really get into it. Yes, and, absolutely. And I can thoroughly appreciate that. <laughs> So now you're at tech and, and you're all about technology. What are some assignments or projects that you used to do that you, that you weren't all exposed to technology that now you've kind of changed the assignment or you've changed how you assess it? What, what are some things you're doing now differently? So when I was in school, um, getting, getting my teaching certification, lit circles were really big. And I remember struggling but wanting to do them because the idea of offering student choice, I'm such a proponent of that, allowing the students to really control the classroom, student centered, and it helps them be engaged. But I always had that problem of I felt like I was at a loss because I couldn't necessarily read every single book that all of my 120 students were reading or, you know, how do I organize it 
in this classroom with everybody talking at once. And I tried it and, you know, I, I, I struggled through it, but now I do it digitally. And I've created a, what I call the multimodal research project that corresponds with their independent reading. And, um, they share some research and do some really create multimodal presentations. Um, they have a choice of what they want to do. They can do YouTube videos or um, Snapchat conversations. And then they also do a, a research component. In the end, they sort of do a book talk, but it's a digital book talk. Those are all really awesome ideas. <laughs> and more people need to do that. Do you Are you big in your department as far as sharing what you're doing? Um, yeah, I mean, we all, we all collaborate really well. That's the one great thing about West Morris is that, um, we also just over the past couple of years really tried to solidify the fact that we are a, a district and there are two schools. So we've even been doing a lot of collaborating, uh, across the way with our sister school, Mendham. And we have a really close knit group and we're all really good at certain things. And that's what's great. Everybody's different, but we all bring something really awesome to the table. And I would say that what I bring to the department is definitely this tech integration and creativity. I feel like every time I have somebody on here, all I hear is awesome story after awesome story. So that's an awesome story. Thanks. <laughs> Do the teachers, and, and this question comes from what I'm doing in my own graduate studies currently. You're on board with tech. What is your experience working with teachers who maybe aren't into technology, but, you know, they use it because they have to, because there's Google. What, what's that like for you? I feel like it's okay. You know, just like it's okay that we have students that enjoy the, the formulaic essay and we have students that would prefer to do a visual response and we have students that really enjoy talking and participating but aren't so great at doing their homework. I feel like the same thing goes for adults and, you know, I know that I'm not the best at diagramming sentences, but I can really show you how to express yourself and publish it to a global community. So, I think it's important that we all learn from one another. And that's really what I'm inspired by with ed technology is that we can do that. We can meet all these really great people and learn from what they're doing. What was the first ed tech tool that you were exposed to when you made this transformation? Wiki spaces. I was trying this, this um, book talk idea Um but I had some issues with creating it was kind of stressful. The kids weren't really familiar with it. And none of them had their own space that could easily be viewed with other students or not viewed. It was just too much to try to mess around with the sharing and privacy. Um, and for me to be manager of all of them, all of my students' wiki pages was just way too much work, too much configuring. And it wasn't necessarily sharing it with everyone because then everyone needed to go in and create their own wiki page and link it to mine and it was just too much work. I, I can see the stress as if teaching English wasn't stressful enough, then you've almost become the manager of upwards of 150 websites. Right. And nobody wants to do that. No. <laughs> um, what are some of your favorite ed tech tools right now that you're maybe in love with and like they're your go-to bag of trick tools? Yeah, there are definitely two. Um, aside from G class folders and all things Google apps and extensions, there's this tool out called SiteLighter. It's um it's basically a 21st century all-inclusive digital writing platform. And I started using it last year when there was a free promo, um, like a trial session. And now I am using backward design with SiteLighter in mind to create the best writing assignments I've ever created in all of my nine years of teaching. What is the SiteLighter web address so I can get that and make sure it's in the show notes? It's... SiteLighter.com, C-I-T-E-L-I-G-H-T-E-R. And what is the other tool? Pear Deck, which isn't public yet. Um, I'm, I'm currently beta testing it, but it's a really great, easy-to-use interactive tool. Um, it's it's awesome if, you, you know, you have a one-to-one -one district or you can, like I do, uh, rent out the Chromebooks for my class. It's a great way to keep students engaged and on topic. And those kids that don't really like to participate are participating when they're using Pear Deck. Now, I'm just going to quick on a point you just said. When, when, you're, when you're signing out the Chromebooks, are you a Chromebook hog in the school? 
oh my god, I monopolized the Chromebook like it is my own. <laughs> <laughs> it has a permanent niche that I've carved out in between the wall and a couple tables for it to stick nicely so that it's not intrusive to the classroom. And everybody knows if the Chromebook can't be found, it's probably in my room. That's awesome. <laughs> How many Chromebooks does your school have? Um, we have a cart of 24, and then we have a cart in the library that students that are in the library can sign them out individually. Um, we also have another um, two sets of cows, computers on wheels. Um, so altogether, we have three cows. We have two or three writing labs and our library and our library computer lab plus a Chromebook in our computer lab. So there's easily enough computers for, for um, you know, 10 classes at a time. That's awesome. And for anybody who's just maybe skipped ahead to this point, her school doesn't have three literal cows. It is, as she said, a cart <laughs> on wheels. Yes. I don't know if my audience is easily confused and I don't want anybody to feel awkward as they listen to this. <laughs> but when you sign up for it, it does moo. So that's, that's the nice thing. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts? And I, this is never an easy question because you're already into education and technology, obviously. But what are your thoughts on the relationship between education, teaching, and technology? How, how, how could they, should they, do they work together? I think that with the way the world is going and the fact that most of the jobs our students will have in the future haven't even been created, and this focus on innovation and trying to do something fresh, something new, and solving problems – we have to be aware of technology. We have to be teaching our students how to use it effectively, responsibly, and to their own benefit. Do you make any connections with your students in terms of social media, any tools you're using? Maybe it's using their cell phones, or what are some ways you bring that in? Our school's BYOD. We just went BYOD, and um, I believe that if a student has a cell phone, they should be using it. They're going to have it out. They're going to be trying to text. You know, we know that this is happening. It is it is a bit addictive, especially when you get on social media. But why not leverage that? You know, they might not come with their textbook. They might not come with their pen. They're going to have their iPod or their cell phone. And if they have it, why not use it? Rather than sit there not engaged, not paying attention to what we're doing or have to leave my room to go get their book, why can't they just pull out their cell phone, they have the Google Drive app on their phone, and access whatever it is I'm trying to share with them. Outside of some of those aspects, when you're using the cell phones, what are some ways that you use the cell phone in the classroom? I often do um, URL shorteners uh, if I haven't you know, put put together a presentation and we're just kind of on the fly and something great happens and we think of a way to share something. Um, I do the URL shortener and the barcode scanner and all of my students walk up and they scan the barcode so that they permanently have access to what I've shared. We also, um, I obviously have a Twitter and uh, I do post some stuff on Twitter. I also use Google Calendar as my homework and like daily organizational syllabus so that students can look ahead. If they're absent, they can check that. Um, they always have that on them. And oftentimes in the middle of class, because we work on a rotating schedule, they'll ask me, you know, what are we doing tomorrow? And I'll say, I, I don't even remember if we meet tomorrow, you know, the rotating schedule. And they'll someone will pull it up and, and remind the whole class, which I think is really great. So they know how to use the tool and they can effectively in, participate in class. Yes. I think, I, I don't know, hashtag awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That, every time I use the word awesome, I'll, I'll try and throw the word hashtag in front of it because then, <laughs> good. then then good things can happen. <laughs> True. Um, what is your absolute most favorite ed tech tool? You can't pick Google. Okay, yeah, it's it's definitely SiteLiner. Absolutely SiteLiner. They have done such amazing things just in the past couple of weeks. They just unleashed their newest update especially for for teachers who are freaked about, freaked out about the park. I know that I am. I know that I feel like I'm not prepared whatsoever for it. The best thing about SiteLiner is that when you join, it has not only a free version, so you don't even have to pay for everything, but if you do, which I think is totally worth the money, you get access to over 300 templates for all different ages, all different writing assignments, especially stuff like park. Because I'm not prepared, I know that if I need to prep my kids for park and I have no idea where to go and where to start, 
I can start there. And it also, it also gives me the flexibility to create my own templates. And it's really about scaffolding and differentiating your instruction so that you actually help students help themselves rather than watch them get frustrated and shut down. And I think that that's the number one biggest struggle with writing is that it is difficult and it is overwhelming and it's stress inducing. And if there's something that can take the stress away and help them and provide the teacher with tools to give productive feedback, which it does instantaneously in the middle of class through infographics. Oh my God, I am getting so much more done in 52 minutes than I've ever done before. That is fantastic. Making use of every minute, and I'm sure your district, like all, is big on bell-to-bell instruction and keep those kids engaged. And I think engagement has been has been a big theme, not just in New Jersey, but everywhere. Right. You know, because attention spans are shrinking every minute. Right. And it's also about breaking things up. You know, if if I've got 52 minutes, I can't be doing the same thing for 52 minutes. So when you break it up into chunks, Site Later also lets you do that. Maybe for a couple minutes, we're, we're working on checking out the extra readings and supplemental material. A couple minutes, we're capturing quotes and checking our citations. A couple minutes, we're going to click and drag and export to a Google Doc. And it's just cool to be able to interact with something, watch how they're doing it, see what ways they organize, and then me as a teacher to make sense of their process so that I'm better able to help them. Absolutely. And since when I first approached you about being here, I did let you know that my interview is semi-structured, so that gives me the the fluidness to be able to jump all around and keep you on your toes. Uh, so I'm going to go back to Google. Sure. Uh, have you had any experience with the recent release of the Google Doc plugins? Yeah, I, I've played with a couple of them. Um, you know, I'm a creature of habit, too, and I've gotten so used to using basic Drive, you know, the, the Drive suite. Um, but I have played with some extensions. I also have my students do, um, they're all creating Google sites as their reflective e-portfolios. So in order to really make their sites stand out, we've downloaded um, TechSmith Snagit, Awesome Screenshot, PicMonkey. So we're playing with things that work well with Google so that they can really make the best portfolio possible. Now with these portfolios, so you've opened me up to jumping to a new area. <laughs> with your portfolios, is this something you set up at the beginning of the year, or is it a, is it a year long? Pro- I, I know the content that they create is year long, but do they also spend the school year learning how to use Google Sites, the tool? Right. So here's what we did. The first two marking periods was really just um, compiling their artifacts. They didn't know it, but I kept stressing it. You know, organize things into certain folders. Maybe it's by you. Unit, maybe it's by genre, you know, whatever works for them. And I provided them a model with mine because they obviously have access to the stuff I'm dropping into their view folder. And, you know, every couple of days I'm reminding them, if you have docs floating around, put them somewhere, you're going to want to be able to find them later. And I would assign certain, you know, chunks of time during class to do these sorts of things. After the second marking period ended is when I introduced the Google Sites and ePortfolio assignment. And um, just about once every two weeks, I would invite a one of our tech specialists in to sort of walk them through different aspects to really customize their Google site. They had a lesson on um, how to customize their header, how to pull in cool backgrounds, ways to change the, um, the size so that it, it could fit on a cell phone versus a laptop. So we spent some time doing each of these kind of like mini lessons, you know, 15, 20 minutes every two weeks, a new feature, how to embed media, add music, add YouTube, so that they could choose to customize as much or as little as they chose and still completed the requirements of the assignment. I think that's fantastic because a lot of teachers will say, I don't have time to teach things like that and cover what my curriculum says I need to cover. So I think what you're doing with mini lessons is a great way to teach students these other skills, these 21st century skills. So kudos to you. 
Thanks, yeah, and I, I feel like if, you know, they're supposed to do some hands-on learning, this is a great opportunity. Unfortunately, English class is not like science lab, where you get to go experiment. Why not try to make it that way? Um, I know I learn really well from hands-on learning experiences. I like to join webinars that allow me to play around with things. So why not give them the opportunity, too? And it makes them more engaged in completing the tasks. Awesome. And I'm sure you also enjoy now appearing on podcasts where you can talk about all these things. Heck, yeah. <laughs> My kids are going to think I'm famous. <laughs> oh, boy. And, and why not? I, the sky's the limit. Now, in addition to teaching, you also teach at Ramapo. Talk briefly about what you're doing in their first year experience program. Sure. So um, I was lucky enough to be asked to teach a course for freshmen. Um, every freshman is required to take a freshman seminar, and uh, it's generally somewhere around 20, 25 students, and we are given what's called peer facilitators, which are essentially um, undergraduate TAs. And we work together with these TAs to really help transform our students from whatever environment they came from in high school to active members of their college community. So we teach them basic reading and writing, communicating skills, like any seminar would be. But we also allot time for how to choose your schedule wisely and how to appropriately use media services. And um, we also allot half an hour after every class for our peer facilitator to have time with our students. So things they might not be comfortable saying to me or with me, they have someone that's their peer but has been through it already to really help them with the transition. Nice. I, I remember I, I did my undergrad work at William Patterson and I had a program similar to that. It was, you know, freshman seminar. That was the title. Nothing fancy. Um, but I imagine now in the year 2014, you know, there are whole different aspects as you described. What are, do you leverage technology in, at, at the college level? Yeah, I'm actually doing some of the same things. Um, I, I share G class folders with them as well. We do use, um, you know, a very specific tool, kind of like Moodle. Um, we have something called Luminous, and that's a great place where they're already all logged into that, so we can automatically e email each other there. But I have them submit their papers before the class that we're going to meet so that I'm able to offer feedback. And then what we do is we get together and we talk about that feedback. And my goal is for them to utilize the feedback to improve their next assignment. So I make sure that we have time to share comments over the internet. I help them craft their theses, you know, digitally because I'm an adjunct. I'm only there that one night a week, the week that we have class and I work a full-time job. So I don't have office hours when some of them are available. So most of what we do out side of class time is really the prep for the class time that we're going to be spending together, which is great. It's exactly like blended learning or a flipped classroom. Now, don't sell yourself short. Adjuncts are people and they are valuable too. <laughs> yes, we are. Now, I'm, I'm trying to follow a timeline here. So we've talked about what you do with, I'll say, little kid students in high school. And now you've talked about what you've done with older kid students at college. You're also a presenter and you've been to a number of conferences. What do you like to teach other teachers? What I like to do is I like to show them how they can incorporate this technology in easy ways so that when they leave my presentation, they have a project that they can jump right into in their own classroom. So when I give a presentation, it's not just look at this great tool. It's here's what I'm doing with this tool. Here's how you can take my project and make it interdisciplinary, transform it into something that might be useful for you. It sounds like one of the taglines of this program, Techno <laughs> technology you can hear about today and use tomorrow. Exactly. So I'm going to fully expect to see you at Ed Camp, New Jersey in the fall. I'd love it. So you need to be there. That's going to be in New Brunswick, uh, not okay. New Brunswick, uh, North Brunswick. All right. At the Linwood Middle School. So you're going to Google Ed Camp, New Jersey. Um, do you have any plans to attend workshops this summer where you're presenting? Yeah, I actually, uh, fingers crossed, do your, you know, mojo dance or whatever you got to do, but I'm hoping to get into the Google Teacher Academy. So that would be awesome. Um, I also plan to present at a presentation called Teach Tech Learn in Kentucky in late June. I'm really excited. Some of the, the cool people I follow on Twitter are actually going to be there. And uh, I've got a couple other opportunities 
later on in the summer. I'm also teaching two cor- courses at um, Innovated Ed ca- uh, classes at my own school, and I've signed up for a couple early fall presentations through Edscape and um, a couple other ones that I found on EdSurge. Awesome. So you are going to be – basically, it's the Natalie O'Neill summer and fall tour coming up. Yeah, yeah, taking the show on the road. Nice. October will be a very busy month. There's like a conference every week in October. Right. It seems like that's how it is in March as well. March is a big month for it too. But March is tough because you have all the testing going on. Yeah, and it's also the end of fencing season for me. So basically from, you know, late November through February, I'm lost in fencing season. So I try to get as much in before and after as possible. Okay, so far through 10 episodes, you might be the greatest transitional guest because <laughs> I wanted, I mean, the sports fan in me as, as a, you know, baseball, basketball, football fan, I know nothing about what I'll say in layman's terms is sword fighting. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to hear a little bit about fencing and sure. just, let's talk about fencing. Okay. So, uh, when I was in high school, um, I was a was an athlete. I played soccer and um, really loved soccer. But my freshman year, I made varsity and late into my season, I dislocated my knee. And it was awful because as a freshman starter, you know, I, I thought I was big time. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm injured and I can't play. So I was going to physical therapy for a while and was feeling really good and got the go ahead to, to continue on with sports. But um, my only other option in my high school at the time was basketball. And I'm five foot two. Basketball really wasn't going to be my thing. And my English teacher, someone I really respected and, and appreciated, said, well, why don't you come out for the fencing team? Fencing? Well, I don't even know what that is. What are you talking about? He said, well, come try out. And, you know, I wasn't really, after coming off of varsity soccer, I didn't want to have to try out. What if I was going to be cut? So uh, I asked him, you know, how can I guarantee myself a, a spot on this team? And he said, well, we don't have any lefty fencers. And I said, but I'm a righty. Ah, I'll give it a shot. And I did. And it was awesome. <laughs> so you are a southpaw fencer. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I thought you, as you started to tell that story, I thought you, I thought you were going to say, oh, you know, I, I played soccer as a freshman, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't violent enough. So I wanted to have a weapon. <laughs> it's funny because if you're really a good fencer and you know what you're doing, you should barely even be making contact. The contact happens so precisely in such a quick time that your tip is just gracing their their fabric just enough so that that little spring clicks. You shouldn't be bending your blade. You shouldn't be rubbing up against them. It, it needs to happen so fast that they don't even know what's happening. Thank you for teaching me something I had no clue about. <laughs> yeah. that, that's what we do here on the House of Ed Tech. <laughs> we teach, we learn, we share. It's awesome. Yes. Um, I've, I've kept you way longer than I promised I would or, you know, said we would. But as I said, when the conversation's good, I'm not going to kick you off and hang up Skype. <laughs> um, but now I'm going to hang up and kick you off. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, how can people connect with you? Because I found you through Twitter. So share all the ways that you're willing to let people reach out to you through. Sure, yeah. Um, you can connect with me on Twitter, which is at TeachNV. You can also connect with me on Google+. Plus. You can even email me. I'm, I'm cool with accepting emails at natvaz18 at gmail.com because, I, you know, I, if I don't want to respond to you, I won't. I'm okay with that. So, uh, yeah, I just feel like if anyone wants to collaborate, I've joined a bunch of the communities on um, Twitter and Google+. And I feel like those are great because you can sort of see if someone wants to talk. It doesn't need to be this all-inclusive conversation. And then if you're going somewhere, you know, shoot me an email and we'll put something together. I'm really actually looking forward to meeting some people and seeing if we can do some classroom collaboration next year, getting our kids to work together digitally. I think that would be really neat. That will be very neat. At, and at that point, and probably sooner, you and I will talk again. Great. Sounds good. <laughs> I, th- I think I'll have to give you, I guess we'll say the first lifetime pass to the House of Ed Tech. Yes. I'll wear that badge with, with pride. So, Natalie, you are welcome anytime that you want to share what you're doing in the classroom. And I'll be happy to, well, if this was radio, I'd say, you know, punch you up and get you on on the hotline. But but anytime you want to chat, you you are more than welcome. This was fantastic. This was great. Thank you so much for having me. 
All right. We'll talk to you soon, Natalie. Okay. Bye. And now my ed tech thought. When to use technology. I recently read an article titled Technology in the Classroom, the right tool at the right time from the website ColecoSpanish.com. And I also recently completed, happily and proudly, my master's thesis, which explored technology integration in high schools. The article shares some great recommendations for what specific technology apps and software a teacher can use for certain activities in a language classroom. I think the resources shared in the article are applicable to all content areas. There will be a link to the article in the show notes for this episode. After reading the article, my thoughts turned to the bigger picture about technology integration and when teachers should use technology in general. Even as an avid lover of technology, I believe that technology is not always necessary. And I know that's surprising considering you're listening to a podcast about education technology. But I believe that the purpose of technology, and again, this is one teacher's humble opinion, is not to take over your classroom and consume every lesson. There is a time and a place. We use the term technology integration, not technology assimilation. So as you're going forward through the end of the year and you're trying to integrate technology or you're using technology a lot, take a step back and think about, is the technology necessary? Could you do the lesson you want to do without technology? Does the technology actually enhance what you're doing? Keep that in mind as you plan lessons that integrate technology. And now for my EdTech recommendation. And this recommendation couldn't be any fresher or hot off the press. This episode, if you're listening to it for the first time when it came out, it's, it's obviously Mother's Day, May 11th. This technology I found on... Friday, May 9th, 2014. So here we go. Here's my recommendation. I'm going to tell you about Rounds. This is the description from Rounds.com. R-O-U-N-D-S dot com. Rounds is a free multi-platform video chat hangout application where you can interact and have fun with friends by playing games, browsing Facebook, watching YouTube videos together, listening to music, and taking hilarious snapshots. Rounds' webcam chat allows you to see your friends' reactions in real time, making it the ultimate social experience. Rounds Hangout is available on the Android and iPhone, as well as through your desktop or laptop's webcam. You can also try their mobile video conferencing, which makes it feel like you are face-to-face -face even when you're halfway across the world. You can have access to the perfect video chat experience with loads of fun and memorable activities. Rounds Video Chat is the app you need to try for yourself. In order to try this, and it only works in Chrome, you need to go to rounds.com slash live. It works in Chrome. It's a simple plugin that will then allow you to view any website with up to 12 people and be able to talk and interact. And you have these cool little round frames that everybody's face appears in. And you can mute them, you can send them a message, and there are definitely ways to use this technology in education. For example, if you're using Chromebooks in your classes, you can have students conference about a website they are looking at. Uh, if you go to a computer lab that has the Chrome browser, you can be on video explaining tasks for the class if they all run the plugin. If, say, you're on a Chromebook and everyone else is on uh, desktop computers. What are some other ideas that you have that you could use rounds for in education? I'd love to hear your ideas, so head over to mr.chrisnessy.com and click on the speak pipe button and send me your ideas on how you can use rounds in education. And now it's time for the House of EdTech VIP. Episode 10's VIP is Richard Byrne. Richard is a former high school social studies teacher best known for developing everybody's favorite website, freetechforteachers.com. He taught for eight and a half years at Oxford Hills Comprehensive High School in South Paris, Maine. 
During that time, Richard piloted a one-to-one -one laptop program that eventually went school-wide. Richard also coordinated a quote-unquote laptop squad to support teachers' use of laptops in their classrooms. He has been invited to speak at events all over the United States, Europe, Australia, Asia, and the Middle East. His work is focused on sharing free web-based resources that educators can use to enhance their students' learning experiences. I 100% recommend that you, that you connect with Richard Byrne. Uh, he is on Twitter at R.M. Byrne, B-Y-R-N-E. He's also on Google+, google.com slash plus Richard Byrne. And obviously the website, freetechforteachers.com. And that's the number four in the web address. Congratulations, Richard Byrne, the House of Ed Tech VIP. That's going to do it for this episode of House of Ed Tech. I am Christopher Nessie. Keep the conversation going and visit my website, mr.chrisnessy.com. You can check out the show notes for this episode at mr.chrisnessy.com slash 2014 slash 05 slash house of ed tech 10 dot html. And that's the number 10. If you have questions or comments, send me a voicemail. I would love to feature it on a future episode. You can head over to the website and click the speak pipe button on the, on the site, or you can call 732-903-4869. And you can email me at nessie, N-E-S-I, dot history at gmail dot com. Or you can hit me up on Twitter, at Mr. Nessie, and use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. If you enjoyed the show, please consider rating and reviewing the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Your five-star rating and positive review will help keep the House of Ed Tech front and center for other teachers and educators to discover. Be sure to come back to the house for the next episode, which will be released on May 25th, 2014, when I talk to Mr. Matt Blackman. Matt is a high school physics teacher in Madison, New Jersey, and he's the founder of the innovative EdTech company, The Universe and More. And I will be fresh off of my master's graduation from Caldwell College, soon to be Caldwell University, and the big day is Sunday, May 18th. So I will graduate and get my master's in the off week of the broadcast schedule. I'm looking forward to closing one chapter and starting another. I will also get to see my good pal, Superintendent Jay Eichner, and I can't wait to get a selfie with Superintendent Eichner. Thanks for listening, and remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try.